Alvaro, good. Now I can see you. Just got to get against your microphone. Hello. Perfect. Hello. Hey, sorry about that. Zoom is its okay. own beast. If we could only work as well as Postgres. Um, anyway, <laughs> great to have you. All right, so we're, while we're just welcoming everybody in, get a little bit of music from our resident DJ. Um, and as always, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. We got a lot of people, a lot of folks signed up for this meetup. I uh, did not realize how much of a celebrity Alvaro is in the Postgres world, um, but very, very good to see the amount of interest in this topic um, and the amount of interest from really, really top people I'd like to add as well. Um, got a lot of traction in Twitter and a lot of folks that have been sending me questions. Um, so we got a lot of stuff we want to get through today. Um, that being said, for people that it's your first time, welcome to the Data on Kubernetes community. My name is Bart Farrell and I have the good fortune of leading this wonderful space where we're talking about all the things related to running data on Kate's. And what we like to do is very much in a community spirit. Um, so we want people to be sharing knowledge, to be working things out, to be troubleshooting. We invite all of you to our Slack. We also have t-shirts, um, we have stickers. And most of all, a very interesting story as well about just how this event is happening right now. Um, when I started getting involved in the community last year in around October, I literally went and started looking at the different folks that were in our in our Slack. And one of the first names that appeared was Alvaro's. So I sent him a message. And sure enough, uh, like the very nice person he is, he responded. Um, and so we started chatting and realized that we we're both living in Spain. And so anyway, so from there, just uh, kind of took it from there and see in we're talking about you know, hey, what would be something that's interesting for you? Alvaro is a very, very experienced speaker. He'll let us all know more about that. Um, also very, very lucky to have another very important person in the uh, Postgres community, who is Dimitri Fontaine, who's also a friend of Alvaro's, who wrote The Art of Postgres QL, um, and is kind enough, was kind enough to give us a, a promo code to, uh, to send out some copies. So if you go to the art of uh, postgresql.com, uh, um, and you enter the promo code DOK21, all right, which I will send out to everybody right now. You can get um, his his book with a 21% discount, all right? So if you want to take a look at that, just like I said, go to the Art of Postgres. I'll put in the link later. Um, but once again, I think it's a really good reflection on community spirit. And also taking a, look, a further look at the Postgres international community is also a very strong community. So I'm interested to hear what Alvaro has to say about what makes that uh, community work? We already got a question. We already got a question. I'm sure Alvaro knows it's got a lot of trolls out there. Uh, so we'll have plenty of action while we're talking. Alvaro also created a foundation for Postgres. We're gonna have to hear about that too. Um, oh yeah, and we're gonna have to get into the, all the different pronunciation issues too. <laughs> oh, it's gonna, it's gonna be fun to do. Yeah, no, no, I have no doubt about that. Um, so, like I said, uh, I I wanna I want I want Alvaro to have, have as much time to, to get into his presentation as possible. Um, so, like I said, um, he's also a great example of a person who's a really really high level, but is very eager and willing to help. So, I invite all the folks that have questions. If we can't get to them today during the meetup, you can definitely come and check us out on Slack. And, and Alvaro is very responsive um, in our general channel and our DBH in our databases channel. Um, so definitely a person who's a great resource to, to get in touch with. Um, that being said, I will turn it over to you, Alvaro. Can you give us a little bit of background about how this passion, this love affair with Postgres started? Um, a little bit about the, the company that you started as well. Um, and then also a little bit about your experience about how you got started with Kubernetes. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So Postgres, Postgres stuff first, just because it comes first, right? So it's, it's been an interesting ride because um, I started many, many years ago, more than 20 years ago with Postgres. Uh, I was at the university. I had to, to build a website project. And I asked one of my colleagues that was a bit older than me and more experienced, he said, hey, I need to store some data. And I heard there's something called a database where you can put some data in there. I think that's what I need. Tell me which one to use. He said, Postgres. I said, okay, fine, whatever. I researched on it and I started using Postgres. Said, yeah, this works and it's fine. It works for me. And never stopped working for me. So. I was like, why to change? Um, Postgres does fulfill all my needs and it did for the last 20 years. So I never had any reason to look into on any other database. I mean, I have looked into other database. It's just mostly because uh, we offer services to migrate from other databases to Postgres. Uh, but for, for part of my own needs and company needs and customer needs, we've never been able to say, you know, this has been in a situation where we say, no, Postgres doesn't fulfill this need, we need to look elsewhere. Never happened. 
it's a very versatile da database, very powerful, extremely reliable, something you can really trust and build upon. So we actually have built upon a lot of technologies on top of it, but it worked. It's it's worked always. So no need to 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 look into any other database. So that's that's been my, my journey. I started this as a, as a user, then became a database developer uh, from the perspective of developing DDL code applications, triggers, store procedures, you name it. Then I became DBA, then trainer, and then we started offers, offering professional services. So I think I've, I've rode all the way in terms of Postgres itself. Very, very good. And just a little quick trivia as well too, before we get into where you're at right now, does anyone know what Postgres was originally called? And I'll give you a hint. It may have something to do with the title of Alvaro's company. Does anybody know? You can put it in the chat, put it in the chat. What was the original name of Postgres when it started out? That's a good one. We want, good one. To, we want to test our audience. We want to test our, they were quick to jump on you with pronunciation and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. So I think it's only fair. I, I want to see if someone is, you can put the answer in the chat. Does anybody know what Postgres, and you, you can also take this time to search if you want. Do you know the name of what it was called? Uh, we got one, uh, uh, no, no, before it was called Postgres. Okay, very, very good. All right, fantastic. All right, so we did, we did get a correct answer. Uh, we did get a correct answer, which is in fact, yes, it's ingress. Um, and also for a little geography question, um, if you know where I'm from, where was, where was the, the birthplace of Postgres? Where was it, where was it created? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll maybe oh, clarify good. Oh, good. Well, Muhammad is Muhammad's super fast. That was good. Yeah, that was okay, fast. Okay, that okay was... but maybe we can clarify because uh, uh, we, got, we got someone saying that Ingress was a different code base. Alvaro, you can maybe comment on that. Yeah, uh, but I'll come a little bit later just because yeah. I want to talk about something related to this. So I'm going to hold on uh, until then. Um, let me answer you about Kubernetes, how I got started with Kubernetes. It's quite related to Postgres itself. So... Um, as, as part of, of my, my, my company, uh, we, we've been doing Postgres professional services for many years, and we found like a common pattern across all of our customers and the work we're doing for them, which is that, you know, installing Postgres on your laptop is super easy. You can do it in 30 seconds. If you get install Postgres and you're done, if you're using something like Kubernetes. Now, deploying an, a Postgres enterprise stack, like for production grade, Postgres requires a lot of components next to it. You need connection poolers, you need high availability, you need monitoring, you need backup solutions. All these are totally different software that do not come with Postgres. You need to bring them from the ecosystem, bundle them together, configure them together. Then you want to, of course, do um, infrastructure as code and you want to code this into Terraform, into Ansible, into everything. And doing all this takes literally weeks for a Postgres expert to do. Right? So we, are, we thought, you know, this is a hard problem to solve. We need to find ways to automate this. But the problem is that environments are very different from each other. You go from a cloud environment to another cloud environment. The APIs are different, even though there's Terraform. Then you need to go inside of the server. Then there's different operating systems. There's, uh, then you go on-prem. That's a totally wildly different world. And you talk about storage and you talk about networking. It was a really complex problem. So we started thinking how we can automate this. And you said, we need an API. We need an orchestrator API somewhere would abstract us away from the small details of how storage is laid out or how the networking happens or how to run a workload on a, on a server and, you know, and, and, and run this in, in an independent way. Is there an API to do that? And then, oh, wait, Kubernetes is apparently that. What is this Kubernetes thing? <laughs> and then we started diving deeper. It's like, well, this is exactly what we needed. And so that's uh, how I got started and companies that got started into Kubernetes. And now we're developing a solution for running Postgres and Kubernetes based on all these principles. Wow. All right. Very, very good. And what's the name of your company? Just in case people don't know. Ongress. Ah, we've gone from <laughs> Ingress to Postgres to Ongress. All right. So nice, nice little evolution that we got here. Um, all right. So, so yeah, Alvaro, with that being said, you can feel free to share your screen and we can jump right into your presentation. Um, as, as we're talking, feel free to put your questions in, in the chat and we'll try to get to them either on the go or we can also deal with them at the end. Or like I said as well, Alvaro is definitely a person that you can contact directly in our Slack and he'll be happy to help you out. Um, so I really, really, I really mean that. I'm not, just, I'm not just saying that because we're a wonderful community. It's a great example of a person you can reach out to for help. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, I guess screen is okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, actually, have tons of ideas here to cover today. But uh, you know, Bart, especially you're, you'll be monitoring the chat. If there's anything, just, just you know, shout anytime. I'll mm -hmm. be happy. 
to be interrupted. All right, so the compulsory uh, who am I slide, I'll keep it short. I run this company called Ongress, which uh, means on Postgres. So guess what we do? Uh, but apart from offering professional services like, like support and, and uh, consulting and training, we actually do a lot of R&D, research and development of Postgres. We try to innovate in Postgres. And today is precisely about Postgres innovation. I'm going to talk about this. Um, other than that, as Bart well mentioned, I do a lot of community work. I participate in the Postgres community. I help found a, a nonprofit foundation in Spain with international goals uh, to promote and develop Postgres. Um, and well, I'm also an Amazon data hero. So I'm, I've been working in the Postgres way, uh, cloud approach, Kubernetes. I try to learn a little bit about everything. So. Before diving into the, the topic that brings us today, we need to, we need to, Bart, um, I'm sorry about this, but we really need to set something straight, okay? Do it. First of all, let's clarify how to pronounce Postgres. Yes. Okay, so the official name is PostgreSQL, which is pronounced PostgreSQL, right? So post, like a blog post, that, that should be easy. By the way, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about pronunciation and I'm not, not, not a native English speaker, so I might get it totally wrong, but bear with me. So post, like post, that's easy. Ingress, it goes after that. Uh, the E sounds like in best, so it's not like post grass. So some people slightly pronounce it like that way. That's probably okay. As long as then you go with the Q and L, they are pronounced like if they were individual letters. So it's not post sequel, it's PostgreSQL, right? Easy. Why the name is like this? Well, this is related to the history. Postgres is Postgres. So after Gress, and this Gress comes from, come from Ingress. That was part of the question that uh, was asked before uh, by Bart in chat, right? So uh, it is a database that was created based on some of the underlying principles of Ingress by part of the team that was building Ingress. It, was, uh, it started as a, as a certainly different code base, but it started that way. So Postgres means after Ingress or post Ingress. Now, I understand that sometimes PostgreSQL, it's a bit hard to pronounce. So it's also accepted if you just say Postgres. I actually prefer this term. It's just because it's easier. We're, we're lean, right? Like, let's be lean. It's just a Postgres and we're done. So this is the important thing to understand how to pronounce Postgres. But still, some people are confused. So let's also learn how not to pronounce Postgres, okay? The first, I would say it's even offensive, right? So please don't use it. And a lot of people do, but please don't say Postgre. Know that there's no S at the end. This, you know, maybe in, in, in the south of Spain, Andalusia may be acceptable because they speak a lot like this, right? But for the most part, try not to do this. And especially, 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 please don't say postre, because that in Spanish especially means totally different thing, right? That's dessert. So that's what we eat after lunch or dinner. So no, definitely not postre, not postre, just postgres or postgresql if you want to be more formal. Are we good with this? <laughs> I'm pretty good. Oh, and here now we got a comment from Nikolai saying Postgrea is very common in Russia. So there's a, <laughs> yeah. the international ways of approaching this. <laughs> <laughs> Not <That was> Postgrea. <laughs> All right, so let's let's go. Let's go. Um, Kelsey Hightower, he's he's very well known, right? Especially in Kubernetes land. He said recently that Postgres is boring, and this is not a bad thing. Uh, you want to have in production boring technology, and boring means that it's something that you need to be petting all the way, way, way around. Yeah, they, just, they, they just work, right? Uh, they're well-known, uh, they're proven tools, and Postgres is exactly that. It's this database, extremely reliable. It's, it's something you can trust. It's, it's something that will very likely not uh, let you down. It's, it's, it's hard as rock, it's rock solid. So this is a boring technology, and it's been so for the last 30 years, and that's great. But that doesn't mean we cannot bring innovation. Um, actually, sometimes you may say, oh, innovation just looks like the opposite of uh, bore, boring, right? Of being boring. Uh, in reality, it's not. You can innovate while keeping the same boring technology at the core. And this is exactly what I want to talk about today. How by keeping 
let's call it the data plane of Postgres the same, just by leaving Postgres as it is, how we can innovate in many other areas that are around Postgres and we can bring something new to the table, especially aligned with the Kubernetes world. So what innovation opportunities may we, may we find here? Because in reality, there are some areas where Postgres has not changed in the last even 30 years, right? The way, for example, you deploy Postgres today is not very different from how you were deploying it a decade or two decades ago, right? So yeah, some things have changed and now there's, there's Ansible uh, and, and there's other technologies, but, but the underlying principles uh, haven't changed significantly. The same with automation. There, there's not much automation around Postgres. Most, most of the things need to be run by DBAs and, and these DBAs are normally required to be quite expert. So this is a barrier of entry for many actually to use Postgres. Um, you need to become quite an expert to understand the, what is called now day two operations and, and how, to, how to handle them. And more importantly is that when we're in the Kubernetes land, it's a shame that um, some things that Postgres kind of replicates that already exist on the Kubernetes ecosystem, you, you need to do it via Postgres and the Postgres way, which is not bad, but for people coming from non-Postgres experience, it would be great if they could just leverage what already exists in the CNCF ecosystem and just use those tools. So there are definitely uh, innovation opportunities here. In terms of deployment, we can just leverage the Kubernetes API, the operators to automate and, and, and deployments and also make them very accessible to non-Postgres experts. Regarding automation, these day two tasks that we can do, Definitely the same thing. Via operators and the post, uh, Kubernetes APIs, we might create automation for those tasks. And I'm also going to talk about this. And, and finally, uh, one of my goals here is to take Postgres as, as if it were a monolith. It is actually a monolith, right? And split some parts which are not core to the data plane, to the boring Postgres that we want to keep having as the same as we had before and just offload to CNCF components that we can run on Kubernetes and make it a more, much more familiar environment for Postgres. So you need less and less Postgres expertise to run an advanced Postgres service. So I'm gonna show examples of a lot of innovations that we have introduced into an open source technology called Stackers. Um, I'm biased here because this is a technology that we have developed um, but I'm just going to briefly mention to it as the examples of how we have decided to implement the ideas that I'm going to be presenting today. If you want to check it out, just go to staggers.io. As I said, this is fully open source technology and you can, you can do this at home. Too. So let's talk about how to deconstruct Postgres and why deconstruct. Deconstruct basically means that we're going to try to see if we can strip off some parts of Postgres um, and replace by uh, either components that are in the CNCF ecosystem or just by different parts that we are gonna compose in different ways. Let's try to essentially see if we can innovate Postgres. So what is the agenda? Let's talk about six main areas of potential innovation. One is using Envoy. Envoy is the proxy commonly used for HTTP. So what is it doing here? We'll find out. Second uh, is talking about distributed logs. Uh, this is something that is quite common in Kubernetes, but it was not common in Postgres and also needed to be solved. So we propose a solution here. Um, then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about general principles about how to build containers, uh, how to make them in less systems and uh, what is the shape of the pod that we have determined in this solution stackers following these principles and how it evolves into a whole architecture for a Postgres cluster on Kubernetes. Um, then we will look into monitoring. Uh, this is kind of an easy part, but you can really go deeper into integration with, with PromQs, Grafana, Alert Manager, and some other components which I'd like to discuss. Last but not least, or, or not last actually, but <laughs> before the last one, there's also uh, some topics that we have also researched on how to uh, stack discuss it comes with a web console, like a web interface. And we discussed deeply and researched deeply about how to leverage the Kubernetes authorization and authentication mechanisms. Sorry, to be more precise, the Kubernetes authorization mechanism, the RBAC, uh, into using it for authentication and authorization of the web UI so that you don't need to create separate pools of users 
for, for uh, Stagros in this case, Swap Console, and you can just leverage what it exists already on Kubernetes Lab, the RBAC mechanism. And last but not least, I want to talk about Postgres uh, expert tasks, uh, day two operations that can be automated via Kubernetes. And this is what I called the cloud nativization of Postgres EVA operations. Probably my pronunciation here is, is terrible, but I hope you get the point. So let's look at Envoy. So would it be possible if we can just start of loading tasks for, from Postgres? Um, for example, parts of monitoring. Monitoring is not necessarily very expensive in terms of Postgres uh, CPU usage, or, but, but the reality is that sometimes to configure some monitoring, you need to uh, be acquiring the Postgres server. Uh, you may need to be uh, changing configuration parameters. Some of those even require restarting Postgres and restarting Postgres means downtime effectively. So it is something that if you could just strip off from Postgres and run it elsewhere, that will be very cool. But there are some other parts we, uh, which are actually quite CPU intensive. And one of those, for example, is SSL. SSL by itself is not that CPU intensive, except if you're establishing connections all the time, which people who don't use connection pooler to suffer. And those can become quite expensive. So why not offload this to Postgres? Well, there was not an option to do this not so long ago, but um, we have contributed code to the Envoy uh, pro uh, project and develop some functionality uh, to, the, uh, to have a Postgres uh, filter. So we have contributed and, and got a lot of help from the Envoy community uh, for a Postgres, for the first time of, of having a Postgres filter. This is a filter that just decodes the Postgres protocol and is able to export metrics to Prometheus. And is also able, this is coming on Envoy next version, to decode Postgres SSL and uh, decrypt the connection and offer an unencrypted connection from Envoy to Postgres, which is great if you're like running on a local environment and offload SSL management from Postgres. This, by the way, not only has the ability of uh, reducing the CPU load, but also allows you to manage the certificates uh, from Envoy's API. And you don't need to reconfigure Postgres in current restarts. SSL configuration Postgres require restart, which means again, downtime just to even to rotate the certificate, something that you don't need to do with Envoy. So I would say this is a quite new uh, innovation. It's been introduced recently. The first version of this uh, uh, filter was introduced this summer, uh, last summer, last uh, 2020. And it already does quite, quite a few things. If you're more interested, there's a link in the bottom that I will, I'll share the presentation online later. Uh, where uh, it was uh, it explains exactly what this filter does, what its capabilities, what it's going to do in the future, because there's many more functionalities coming to this plugin. But let's look a little bit about how architecturally it works. We, we got one comment, Alvaro, really quickly yeah. um, from GQ, who says, I would love to see a Postgres update automation and maybe even Istio instead of Envoy. Yeah, so, so actually Istio is from that perspective is a control plane, right? And, and Istio helps coordinates uh, all the components like Envoy could be. So um, it could be possible to actually use Istio to coordinate the Envoy's fronting Postgres. Uh, I don't think there's any specifics for configuring Istio to, I mean, actually Istio could push down configuration down to Envoy. Uh, proxies. So it's certainly possible that it could be done. I don't think that, it, I don't believe that Istio has right now any specific configuration for Postgres, but I don't see why that could, couldn't be. And specifically about rotating SSL certificates that definitely is managed by Istio. So it could very well happen. Definitely. All right. So again, from an architectural perspective, let me just show you how this works. So let's say a user is connecting to a Postgres database using the Postgres wire protocol, right? Like, like it's shown on the screen. Now, this is good. This is how normally people do these things and it works, nothing against that. Now, if we set up an Envoy uh, proxy just in front of it, so the user connects to Envoy first and then connects to Postgres, just by doing this, we have one benefit. And is that uh, Envoy has a filter, uh, TCP filter, and this filter produces some metrics that exports to, to metric systems like Chrome Cubes, right? And well, this filter will not tell us match, will say by sense, by, by in connections and so forth, but actually that's already quite useful information at some point for, for DBA administrators. Sometimes you, you need to look at the volume and understand that some queries, for example, is returning too much data. So this is already useful. But now let's look at this specific filter that we helped develop uh, for Envoy, which is Postgres specific. When we introduce this filter, 
then the TCP filter, filters in Envoy are changed. So the TCP filter will pass information down to the Postgres filter. And this Postgres filter is going to decode the Postgres protocol and understand it. And then it's going to be able to push further metrics to Prometheus. And in this case, these metrics are quite specific to Postgres because it already understands the protocol. So it sends metrics about connections per second, transactions per second, inserts per second, updates per second, uh, rollbacks per second, errors per second, you name it. Right? So with all these metrics, then you can go to Prometheus Grafana and get real-time graphs, graphs and, and metrics about Postgres operations happening inside of the cluster. But this is all Postgres without even knowing about it. You don't need to query Postgres. You don't need to connect to Postgres. You don't need to configure anything in Postgres. It's totally transparent and free uh, from Postgres. And now let's look at what happens if we introduce the, the new SSL development that is coming with the next Envoy version, which uh, supports the coding SSL too. So this is an extension called Start TLS, um, and these the codes also Postgres SSL. SSL Postgres runs at layer seven of the also layer, not a level four. That's why it's, it's application SSL. That's why it needs a, like a different setup. But this is able to decode the SSL protocol. So if you're running like in this uh, in the screen, you can see uh, everything as a sidecar to Postgres inside the same pod. You're connecting to Postgres via Unix domain sockets, which obviously needs not to be encrypted. Whereas you're ex exposing an encrypted connection to the outside and you're letting Envoy not only uh, handle all the SSL load, but also handling the certificate and key management, which is, a, which is a complicated problem, which again, you can manage from Envoy's API and all this without touching Postgres. So Envoy is pretty good at being a proxy, at exporting metrics and handling SSL. Let Envoy do this and let Postgres focus on the boring part. This is again uh, why I mentioned this is an important innovation where uh, we're offloading parts from Postgres and making them more cloud native because Envoy is well known in the obviously cloud native ecosystem. This is kind of how it looks like. Um, again, I'm referring in this case to, to Stackgres. This is a web UI, comes with some monitoring console. And this is an example of how the metrics are exported to uh, from the Envoy filter to Postgres. You have here uh, sessions encrypted and encrypted and uh, logins. And this is real time information you get from Envoy at zero cost for Postgres. Let's look at the next one distributed logs. So let's imagine you have a 12 node Postgres cluster and uh, there's been some event, uh, there's been some production incident, and you need to try to troubleshoot, write your uh, RCA. And well, what do you do? Well, you SSH to the first node, CD to the directory logs, uh, grab them, AWK, uh, filter them, dump to CSV, uh, find whatever you're looking for, then, oh yeah, this happened on the other node. Then you go to the other node, you repeat the same process, you get it, right? It's quite cumbersome, but that's how pretty much it's done today. What if you could just you know, have all the logs in a central place? There are tools for doing this, uh, but they involve a lot of moving components uh, and they're not Postgres specialized, right? Sometimes the logs are also kept local. So what if the part log partition fills? And this can happen if you misconfigure Postgres. Uh, for example, you start logging all statements uh, that come to the database on a highly traffic database. You can, you can fill up the, the partition with logs. So there's, there's a few problems. And, and then what if you want to query these logs with advanced, advanced tools? Sometimes Unix tools, I love Unix command line tools, they're great, but what if you, you know, want to use more advanced tools like SQL, right? Um, like for example, and, and if, I'm sure you're all SQL experts, but even if you're not, uh, Dimitri's book is a great resource to learn a lot about SQL, right? So you can query your logs with SQL. If you could do that, that would be amazing. Oh, one quick question. Um, sure. Can Envoy do connection pooling? Hmm. That's a very good one. Uh, it can do, but not for Postgres, not for TCP, but that's something that is on the roadmap. It's not set, set on stone when that will be developed. It's something that a lot of people want to have it developed, and I think will land at some point. Okay, perfect. In Postgres filter. Right. So let's look at how we can do distributed logs on Postgres on Kubernetes. So let's say we have a pod with Postgres container, and it has some logs. Let's now take these logs and uh, dump them into CSV format. It's something that you can do easily with Postgres. It's configured to, to dump the logs in CSV format. It's a documented, well-known uh, structure schema. So that, that's easy. And now let's look into the CNCF ecosystem. We want to capture the logs from the CSV files and push it outside of the, of the pod. 
Uh, do you know any tool to do this? Well, there's, for example, Fluimbit, which is a quite lightweight agent that does exactly that. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just take Fluimbit and process these logs, add some additional metadata, and, and get, uh, get them out of this uh, pod. So that's what we have done in Instacris. And then after they've been processed by Fluimbit, we send them to a central location, which we call a distributed log server, which contains FluentD. Again, another CNCF project that is uh, very good for collecting information such as logs and which connects well with Fluentbit. So they cooperate. And here we can receive the logs sent by Fluentbits from potentially many pods, definitely all the pods that make up the cluster. But this is even a multi-tenant architecture, so you can even receive the logs from multiple clusters. So all the pods from potentially multiple clusters can go to the same FluentD where we collect them all. Now, what do we do with all these logs? One option would be to use a database to store these logs. We could store them on, on text files, but that will not take us very far. So we could use a database. Obviously, everybody would say that NoSQL databases are more suitable for this task, but I don't think so. I think we can use very well relational databases for this task, and that will give us even SQL. So uh, let's use a relational database that does SQL. Do you know anyone? Well, I, I know a database that, think, that thinks very well. So why not use Postgres? But then someone will say, ah, oh, you know, but Postgres is going to be very slow. It's not going to be able to accommodate the load. If you have a really uh, heavy traffic website, uh, sorry, a database, you're going to need something else. Postgres is not going to be enough. I will say, okay, let's do partitioning. Yeah, it's still not enough. So actually logs are kind of a time series data. So why not just use one of the fantastic tools for doing time series data on Postgres, like the timescale DB extension, and just store the logs on Postgres plus timescale. And that's exactly what we do. So we take the logs that come from all these pods, from all these clusters, go through FluentD, and then FluentD turns them into SQL statements that are inserted into a Postgres plus timescale database. And then we store them on physical media. Last but not least, uh, as part of the architecture, we also have a controller that runs on, uh, as part of the distributed log server that exposes the REST API, so you can query the logs also via REST API. This is used to power a web UI, so you can also check the logs on the web UI, but at the same time, uh, allows you to uh, connect to the database. So, so this Postgres is a Postgres database with a timescale extension. You can connect directly to this database and query your logs with SQL, or rather go through the web console. So here, uh, we're not only collecting all the logs from all instances of Postgres into central location, but we're exposing it as a SQL interface and uh, through a web interface. The web interface looks uh, similar to this. So uh, it, it's, it's quite powerful. You can see the logs from all clusters, from all pods. You can uh, do a full text search in them. You can select columns, you can filter. Well, you know, you know this stuff. It's, it's quite practical. The main features that this support right now is Postgres and Patroni logs. Patroni is uh, the software used for high availability. Uh, PG Bouncer is coming down the line. It is multi-tenant, so you can use a single distributed uh, server for many uh, potential clusters within a Stackers cluster. And as I mentioned, you can query with uh, SQL or the web console. And about timescale, we're using uh, Apache 2 license version of timescale. Um, and uh, well, it partitions the logs by the timestamp. This is pretty obvious. And it's also uh, very useful here, timescale, to do partition pruning. So uh, the stackers with these distributed logs also supports uh, life cycle and retention for the logs. And in this case, it's quite easy to implement thanks to the functionality that timescale brings into partition pruning. Makes uh, this very simple. One quick question, Alvaro, um, from uh, Jose. He asked, uh, are you installing some extensions by default? Uh, so the distributed server uh, is slightly different from the rest of the pods. Uh, and basically, it's because it installs timescale extension. For any other cluster, no, there's no extension installed by default, but there are several extensions available, which uh, you can install if you want. So that's optional. OK. All right. Let's look at the next one. Um, this is a bit more philosophical question. But, but basically, a container is not slim VM. And, and I've seen quite a few implementations of, of Postgres on Kubernetes where you know, just take like what was in the past a big fat VM and you know, put it down into a container. And then you're running like a one gigabyte container with Postgres and an init system and SSHD and uh, PG Bouncer if you want connection pooling and the uh, metric systems, exporters and, and all those elements inside. 
that that's not how containers are supposed to be containers are supposed to be a hierarchy of process with, with a single root with no init system because uh you can and you should set up probes for those containers and the probes are are made to ensure that your process is running and is performing well and if you have multiple processes the operation either you can do it or, or these probes are quite complicated you cannot monitor them appropriately by the means that the kubernetes system allows you to do right so um, I would say it's an anti-pattern and you should not use it. Instead, you should use containers. So let's look at, in this case, again, falling back into Stackrest, how we have done this. Let me show you a little bit how the architecture of the pod that we have uh, came up with. So first of all, we start with the pod, with the main container, uh, which in this case is Patroni and Postgres. Now, some will say, oh, but here you have already two processes. You're, you're cheating on us, right? You said only one process. But in reality, Patroni is a parent process for Postgres. Patroni starts Postgres. So that's OK. We, they actually monitor Patroni health state, not Postgres directly. Actually, Postgres is monitored by Patroni. So anyway, we have a single container with Patroni and Postgres, which has its own uh, resistant volume for later storage. And, and that's what we have as the pod. Now, let's start adding functionality that sits better as a sidecar, as a, another container which runs within the pod that uh, cooperates, but is a separate part of it. So for example, let's look at connection pooling. Postgres typically almost always requires connection pooling. And uh, this needs not to be on the same container. We can run it on a separate container, connect the uh, Unix domain sockets. This is something we can do within the same pod uh, with the maximum efficiency, efficiency, but we're separating concerns. One container for Postgres, one container for PG Balancer. Now, I mentioned the Envoy proxy before. So um, again, the Envoy proxy is another container that can also communicate via Unix domain sockets. Here, we're combining it with PG Bouncer, so we can connect uh, through PG Bouncer, uh, so, sorry, through Envoy directly um, via the replication protocol, the data protocol, in which case goes through PG Bouncer, and this connects to services which connect externally to clients or to replicas. And Envoy, as, as, as we mentioned, exports metrics to Prometheus. So we already have three containers here within the same pod, but we have a little bit more. We have a, another container called Postgres Util. Postgres, Postgres Util contains administration utilities for Postgres. They're in a separate container because you don't need them on the main container. You can just have it on a separate container, and this will eventually be turned into ephemeral containers, which is a, a new supported feature in Kubernetes. So uh, they will be even more interesting. Then we have as a separate sidecar, the Postgres exporter, which exports metrics to Postgres and, and PG Bouncer metrics to Prometheus. And uh, we have FluentV that I also already mentioned before. We have, from time to time, we have backups. So uh, Stackers also supports automatic backups. And when they're created, they're created as a job, which is technically kind of a container that also runs inside of the pod. And last but not least, we have, in Stackers, we run, uh, operator hierarchy. So we have the main controller, and then there's what we call local pod controllers, which are small operators that deal with the Kubernetes API and also perform maintenance tasks that are local to the pod. So this is the full picture of how a pod looks like in, in Stackrest, where we have the main container and all these sidecars. And we believe this is a much better pattern than having a, a fat container with an init system, with SSH there, uh, with many other components that you really don't need to run the main task. And this leads to slimmer containers, to more secure containers, and to separation of concerns, which makes the build process and security around it much, much clearer. Now, how do we take this to the full architecture of a cluster? This is just for illustration purposes, but basically this pod is the basic unit. And then we can have many pods per cluster, right? The, the, the primary and uh, several replicas, in this case, three. So here we have these three pods. Now, these three pods, in order to connect to them, there is a set of services, like Kubernetes services exposed. So we have a, a primary service, which connects always to the master, whatever it is. Um, there's a high availability supported, and it will route appropriately to the, to the pod that is uh, master at any time. And there are service replicas that load balance across the services, like lots of replicas. Then we have this distributed log server that I just mentioned before, and I explained, and it connects via Fluent B to Fluent D and ships all the logs from all the pods. And then we have the operator itself, which is a Stackrest controller, which also comes with a REST API. Um, and this REST API is also used to power the Stackrest web interface. So this is a whole architecture. 
it's it's uh, it has a lot of parts there, but they are required and they follow these principles of separation of concerns. And again, we believe this is a, a quite unique architecture to configuring Postgres on uh, Kubernetes. Let's look at uh, one that is more um, use, uh, more usual, I would say, in the Kubernetes world is integrating with Prometheus and Grafana. Surely this is something that, you know, it's not a big deal. However, the good thing about doing this for Postgres is to use the specialized knowledge for Postgres and customizing it. So, so basically, you know, uh, you may want to configure specifically the Postgres exporter, the PD bouncer exporter. You should create custom Grafana dashboards to, to build exactly those dashboards that you want to have for Postgres. Uh, customize the queries to, to gather the information that you want to show in the monitoring part. Uh, configure uh, pre-configure alerts for alert managers. So they alert you about conditions about Postgres, for example, you know, the, the uh, topple freezing and, and uh, bloat and all the problems that frequently occur in Postgres. And finally, embedded on the web console. So this is how it looks like. Again, the implementation that we have performed, I'm just using this for illustration purposes of how we have integrated custom dashboards and alerts into, into the software by integrating with Prometheus and Grafana Alert Manager. Um, the another area of potential innovation here is, for, well, first of all, it's actually the web console, right? So uh, if we have a web console like this, there's not so many management web UIs for Postgres. There are for development, for, for DDL, for queries, but not, as for, not that many for cluster management. This is a, as a full web UI for cluster management. Now, if you think about it, this kind of web interfaces, especially in the Kubernetes world, how, how do we authenticate the users? How do we create the users? Most typically, you will create a separate pool of users, which is different from the one you have in Kubernetes, and use it for authentication. And this is, we believe this is quite cumbersome. So instead, we have developed a mechanism that leverages Kubernetes um, RBAC mechanism for, for user authentication and authorization on this web interface. So let's look at how it works. Let's say I have a user, AHD, that's myself, who's connecting to this, this Stackers web console and sends a username and password. What happens afterwards is that uh, this uh, web interface is gonna call our REST API, which I showed on the previous screen uh, with our authenticate request. This uh, REST API is gonna query a secret that exists on Kubernetes. So it's gonna query the Kubernetes API and look for a secret that looks like what you've seen in the screen and say, hey, is there, is there a username called AHT? And if so, give me the credentials. And uh, you can see here that there's a Stackers username and a Kubernetes username, just in case you want them to be fair, to be different. Otherwise, you can just keep it the same. So this is a standard secret you create with the standard Kubernetes tools and we'll create, uh, we'll have the credentials that you want there. And then if everything's correct, the system will, uh, the REST API will validate your credentials and then will emit a JWT token a JOT token that uh, will be used for authentication from the web console. This JOT token will contain inside a reference to the Kubernetes username that is used for um, user authorization. Once you have this, you can finally issue operations from the web console to perform any given operation. And this operation will in turn call Kubernetes using a special header called impersonate user. And it will pass the username that we got from the JOT token to impersonate that user and make the call to Kubernetes as if we were that user. In other words, Kubernetes will allow this operation with, uh, based on the permissions that the user really has. So basically, even though this may sound so complicated, what you see is that just by creating a secret, Kubernetes secret, which is quite a standard tool in Kubernetes, obviously, you can create users for the web interface and they will have the same permissions as they have via the console, the command line, uh, via the permissions that you have granted, via the RBAC mechanism to this very same user. And last but not least, let me speak about what uh, we call the cloud nativization of the Postgres DBA operations. One of the goals that we have here is to try to widen the Postgres user base. Uh, Postgres is, 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 a, is the database, I love it, what can I say right about it? But um, not a lot of people are experts in Postgres. And to really run a production cluster, you need a lot of expertise. It's not that it's super easy to manage. So that's a, that presents a problem, right? It requires a lot of knowledge. Um, but at the same time, many tasks that you need to perform for Postgres maintenance 
could be automated, automated, especially on Kubernetes because of the APIs. So what we have done here is to try to take most, some of the most frequent operations that are available in Postgres and try to automate them and encode them in a way, uh, typically using CRDs, uh, which is a standard Kubernetes mechanism, as you all know, which is quite well known to the Kubernetes user. In other words, we want to make, if you're a Kubernetes administrator, Kubernetes user with enough knowledge to write a few channels, then we want you to become in, immediately also a Postgres expert. We are going to bake all the uh, knowledge that Postgres requires, automate the operations, and then you just need to write a YAML uh, to do that. So let's look at an example. And this is an example of uh, where something that is coming on version 1.0 is what we call SGDBOps, Stackers database opera operations. So you just write the YAML that looks exactly what we see on the screen. You specify uh, metadata for the operation and then the specification say which cluster you want to operate in and which kind of operation you want to you want to you want to take. Let's say, for example, you want to take a backup, manual backup. It also supports automatic backups. So let's say you want to take a manual backup whenever you want. So just write the YAML file and execute it via kubectl, uh, right? So this will go to the Kubernetes API and be persisted on HCD. You get the point, and then you can just um, call. Uh, from the Kubernetes API to the Stackers operator. After this, the Stackers operator is going to look at the resources that you already have as part of your cluster and uh, will create the backup job, which is the tool that we use for backup creation. This will, in turn, create this job inside of the pod, will run wallg, which is the tool that we use for backups with all the parameters, with all the environments, with everything that you need. and this will be stored on cloud storage, which is the way backups works in Stackers. And then this will return information back from the uh, from the job, right? This information is going to flow back as a status to the Stackers operator. And this status information, the Stackers operator is going to turn into information that is going to go back to the YAML file, to the very same YAML file, to provide feedback to the user as part of the status field of the CRD. And with this, we have completed the life cycle of just with a YAML file, you create an operation, you encode an operation, and this operation will be run, and the status will feed you back as part of the status field of the CRD. Uh, right now, we're supporting on the next version the ability to run Postgres restarts, to run minor version upgrades, to run major version upgrades, to run benchmarks with PGBench, backups, control restarts of the cluster, and a few other operations that are coming down the road. So, and all these just by writing YAML files with no Postgres expertise required whatsoever. So this is it. Um, I think we have some time so for some, some questions. Uh, there could be a lot of options here for doing a lot of demos, but I didn't have much time <laughs> uh, to, to stay uh, to do this. We can do that at a later time, or if you can ask me, I can I can demo you any of these concepts. In the meantime, if you have some questions, please join our communities in, in Slack and Discord, slackstackers.io, discordstackers.io. And Bart, I think I'm open for more questions if there's any. Yeah, we've got plenty of questions, and and I think well, anyways. Interestingly enough, our first question is from Michael, saying, "Do you integrate Patroni into the Stackgres operator?" And I'd also like to take this as an opportunity to give a big shout out to Alexander Kukushkin, who's also a good friend of Alvaro's, who was on our program in in 2020, who's also known as Mr. Patroni. Uh, but anyway, going focusing on the question, Alvaro, the question is, "Do you integrate Patroni into the Stackgres operator?" So, yeah, first of all, actually, thank you a lot, uh, Alexander, Sasha, uh, for all your work in, in Patroni. It is, it is a fantastic tool for Postgres HA. And yes, it's absolutely integrated into, into the operator, into the pods created by the operator. Um, the integration work uh, is, is basically driven by uh, the fact that Patroni is a parent process to Postgres. So we just need to introduce it into the main container, uh, the process, uh, it is started the container itself with Patroni and Patroni starts Postgres. Uh, it needs to be pushed down some configuration, but that's pretty much it. It's, it's not something that is, is very complicated, but yes, it's, it's fully integrated Patroni into Stackgres, controls uh, high availability, does automatic failover, uh, uses uh, you know all the advantages of Patroni. It uh, uses Kubernetes API for ETCT storage. That, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's fully, fully integrated. 
I don't know if this fully answers the questions. There was something else that you were looking for. Well, we have a bit of time still to follow up. Um, another question from uh, from GQ who asked a, a question previously. What could be the challenges? Um, what could be the challenges for making a Postgres upgrade automation? So, in general, a, a Postgres uh, sorry a Postgres uh, automation. It's it really depends on the operation itself, right? Like what kind of operation are you trying to automate? Some operations are easier than others to automate. And it really depends on the nature of the operation. The ones we're tackling right now is those that are easily repeatable that can be, you can write an algorithm, let's say to run that operation. For example, let, let, let's look at the, at the cluster restart. Um, a cluster restart is an operation that you, you can do in order. You can start from small instances, then go, uh, sorry, from, from replicas. Mm -hmm. uh, you can restart one replica and then you can uh, switch to another one. And, and so this is something that is a pattern that you can automate. Uh, you're also, also asking about uh, major version upgrade. This is a little bit more complicated, but it's also a process that you can automate and we have automated. This is gonna come on the next on the next stack, the stack risk version, right? So um, to upgrade, uh, ver uh, to do a major, let's actually, let me just illustrate example with a minor version upgrade just because this is likely easier to do. So on a minor version upgrade, because minor versions are compatible across the same major version, what you can do is just basically spin up a new instance that already brings, is brought up with the new Postgres minor version. Then you set it up as a replica and that starts replicating from the, from the cluster. Once this replica is fully online, you kill one of the old replicas. Then you iterate this process until you reach all replicas are in the new version except for the master. Then you do a control failover with Patroni from this master to one of the other replicas. And then you delete the old master and that's it. Um, of course, there's a, l a lot of more uh, small details into this, but you can automate this operation fully with the Kubernetes API. This would be very hard to do in an environment that is not Kubernetes, but it's something you can do on Kubernetes and we've done it already. All right. Um, just looking at the chat, a couple other questions that we got here. Um, so what's uh, default TTL for Patroni and can I change it? Oh, and, Fab and Fabrizio already jumped in, but you can jump in too, Alvaro. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess we can switch to another question from Mohammed that was uh, asking some questions earlier. So Mohammed was asking, what are the performance uh, overhead, I imagine referring to cost, when running Postgres in Kubernetes? Well, this is a question that, that comes quite often. Uh, we have benchmarked the performance difference by running Postgres on containers and specifically on Kubernetes. And it's almost negligible. You, you may not find a difference. There's only one scenario where you may find a difference, but that's not a production scenario. And it's when, when, you're, when the disk you're using for Postgres is local to the pod, is an ephemeral disk, and, and it's not an external disk. In those scenarios, yes, but that, that's not a production scenario. That's just for, for toying around. But when running on external disk, the performance, a container does not have significant IO performance. Container is not the virtualization layer. I mean, it's some way, but it's, it's just very lightweight uh, abstraction provided by the kernel very efficiently, which almost does not involve IO at all. So um, as long as, the, as, the, as you're running external storage, performance, I would say is hard to measure. It's one, 2% even if that, if that is. Okay. Um, then we have a question from Oleksi. Um, so, hey, Alvaro, can you elaborate on the approach of the operator hierarchy? Instead of having a single operator to manage everything, how do you split your operators and what benefits do you see in that approach? Good question. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a very good one. So we started, in, you know, the operator is, is a well-known Kubernetes pattern, which involves kind of several, two, two parts, a controller and one or more CRDs. So we started that way. But we found out soon that there are certain operations that might better be performed by other components. For example, we also have the REST API, which powers the web UI as well as all the components. And that also needed to interact at some point directly with Kubernetes. So it, it was wise to also implement what's called the, called the reconciliation cycle as part of the REST API so that the REST API can also communicate with Kubernetes directly. And uh, this is as an online operation by operation basis. So, who, who needs to listen on the, on the event stream coming from Kubernetes about different events in different ways. Well, that was a split. But more specifically about the local pod controllers. So the local pod controllers are just meant to perform 
local to the pod operations. And those are easier to perform from a controller that is running inside of the pod at something that is external. So let's look, for example, at, uh, at a backup job, for example, or our reconfiguring Envoy via the API, right? So if you wanna uh, create something that touches the file system, uh, the first versions we were doing is just, you know, by running a kubectl exec. Uh, so the operator, in order to directly touch something within the pod, was, was running a container there, a job, and doing a kubectl exec. That's not very elegant. I mean, it worked, uh, but it's not very elegant. If you have a local pod controller, this local pod controller can directly run commands uh, within, the, within the pod and run the appropriate binaries or the appropriate commands that you want to run for that operation to succeed. Now, you could create the, the main controller could communicate with the local pod controller in you know, order to communicate the actions that you need to run, but it's actually much better to communicate via the Kubernetes API. So the local pod controller could just be listening to a subset of the operations that you want to uh, listen to uh, via the reconciliation cycle and just act on them. So you already have this communication bus established and that's already Kubernetes. Think also of reconfiguring Envoy. Let's say you want to rotate SSL certificates uh, by this functionality that supports SSL offloading. Uh, well, that could also done from the main controller, but you, you, can, you can have this uh, gRPC interface on the local pod controller and talk directly to the Envoy, which is next to you. All right, very, very good. Uh, we're, pretty much on the, we're pretty much out of time for, for the hour that we had scheduled. That being said, as you can see, Alvaro is extremely efficient and thorough at answering questions, also extremely efficient and thorough in giving a presentation. Um, do you have any other talks or conferences planned for this year? Obviously, we understand it's a, kind of a complicated year, but particularly, maybe we can talk about something that's going to happen in Ibiza in June? <laughs> Definitely. Um, th thank you for, for, for that uh, spoiler. So as part of the, the nonprofit work that, uh, that I do and a lot of people from my team, there's this conference uh, that we are, there's this foundation that we created in Spain. And uh, one of the goals, one of the many goals that this uh, foundation has is to organize international, thoughtful, forward-thinking Postgres conference. Uh, and uh, we decided uh, 2019, when we started all this work, that if we wanted a different Postgres conference, a Postgres a conference where people could just sit in a relaxed place and talk about the future, about innovating Postgres, about what lies ahead of us, that has to be a very, very good place. And uh, for those of you who live in Spain or maybe Europe, you might be familiar with Ibiza. Uh, Ibiza is a fantastic island in the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's also well known for clubbing and discos and house music, but it's also well known for the quality of its beaches and the Mediterranean food and the sun and its beautiful landscapes. So that was an ideal location. So we organized that conference in 2019. It was a huge success. Uh, I'll write down the address on the chat, pgidz.io. That was canceled 2020 because of obvious reasons and uh, fingers crossed that's going to happen again 2021. So stay tuned, please uh, check it out or follow uh, PGIBC IBC, uh, on Twitter and we'll be uh, posting news when the conference is gonna happen, but I definitely hope it's gonna happen and a lot of Postgres talks will happen there. And I hope uh, Kubernetes will be significant part of it too. And our community has full intentions of participating in any way possible, however the event is done. And I think it's also interesting too that you were mentioning that, you know, that we don't find maybe as many experts in, in Postgres as perhaps that we see in, in other kinds of databases. So I think that's why it's very, very important that these things do happen. However, if you don't know a lot about the history of, of Postgres, as we were talking earlier about uh, ingress and it's in the early days in, in, in Berkeley in California in the eighties, and then moving on to the first release in the nineties, which I believe was 1996, 1996, 97, 1997, when it was officially released as, as Postgres. Um, but, uh, but like I said, the, if you, if you look at the material and, and you see how the community has operated independently for such a long period of time, um, I think it is a very, very interesting use case of how these things can be done. Um, that being said, I, I think that in terms of what we were able to accomplish in an hour, this is definitely one of our more productive meetups. Um, had some good questions, but like I said, you definitely need to reach out to Alvaro, whether it's in the uh, Stackgrass Slack, whether it's in our Slack, whether it's on Twitter, it's the, all the people that we've talked to in the, in the Postgres world, Dimitri Fontaine was super quick to, to jump in and, and offer us a promo code. 
um, for the people that were attending today. Um, and also to be able to, to give away a, one of his uh, one of his books, The Art of Postgres, uh, Postgres QL. Um, so we'll be happily giving that away uh, in, the, in the coming week. And anyway, as is tradition in the data on Kubernetes community, um, Gorka, can you share my screen? We always have Angel, who's our resident uh, graphic recorder, doing some visual thinking, outlining all the different things that we're talking about. Um, so this is the visual representation that he was able to get from, uh, from today's conversation with, uh, with Alvaro. As usual, thank you very much, Angel. And as another reminder that we always like to do in our community, um, I think so much we can all agree about this is, is generosity and giving our time and our resources. So we will be making a donation to The Last Mile, which is a foundation in the United States that helps incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals learn programming. We are starting to work on the very beginning of, of some resources for them um, to learn more about databases and Postgres will be no exception. Um, so looking forward to, uh, to working more closely with them in 2021. Um, so once again, thank you very, very much, Alvaro. I have no doubt that this is not going to be the last time we're going to have you on. Um, I think we may have to get a, some kind of a panel next time. Maybe we could get Dimitri. Maybe we could also get uh, Alexander Kukushkin. We can get some other folks oh, on here too. Uh, there's, we got some really, really uh, high level knowledge. Um, so, so yeah, I think, uh, anyway, I'm very, very happy. This is a, it's not the end of my day, but it, it, <laughs> certainly the highlight. Um, so Alvaro, thank you once again, and look for, looking forward to seeing everybody in Slack. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me and everybody for attending. Perfect. See you. Take care.